Eve Lee is an award-winning, internationally recognised writer, working between theatre, screen, games, installation and digital art. Eve's work has been put on at theatres such as the Royal Court, Bush Theatre and is currently working on commissions for the RSC, the National and more. Hello Eve, how are you doing today? Uh, I'm good, how are you guys? Yeah, really, really good. Thank you so much for coming on and talking to us today. Um, when we set this up, you were one of the first people that popped into my head to, to talk to after you taught a workshop for me when I was um, doing a course at High Tide. I really wanted to, to get you on and talk to you because the, the way you talk about playwriting and the way you, you flip it on its head and, and offer a, a different opinion is really interesting to me. So thank you so much for giving up your time and talking to us today. That's so kind of you to say. I actually really vividly remember I taught a, a game development workshop to you guys. Yeah. Uh, and your, I'm not going to repeat any of the hilariously funny things that you came up with, but I, because it's just not going to be as funny, like when I'm just no. like weirdly repeating it like three years later on a podcast, but like <laughs> you're so brilliant and it, and uh, you left a, a really deep impression on me as well. And I'm really honored to uh, be part of this. Oh well, thank you so much. That was that was really. I didn't I didn't expect um, flattery backs. So that's really kind of you. Thank you so much. Um, we'll just sort of do a really basic question to start off with, really, because I think a lot of people have slightly different answers to this. What is a playwright? Uh, a playwright is somebody who uh, writes stuff down that makes bodies move. Um, I love that. I, I think about it in terms of, I'm sorry, it's like, I wish I could say that in like a less clunky way, but like the way I think about it is a lot in terms of like, I feel like it's an analogous process to computer programming. Um, that like what you're doing is you're trying to put down words in order to set bodies in motion. Um, yeah, that's what you're trying to do. Yeah, I like that. I, I remember I had playwriting described to me once as, sort of forming a like a constellation of stars and then the people that take the work then make the patterns as it were which seems quite similar to what you said you see you put in the program then you see what the the people do with it I, I, I really like that um what's the most important bit of advice you've been given about writing in your career playwriting writing in general uh that you have to do it as much as possible um uh, which is to say, like, which isn't to say that you have to do it well <laughs> as much as possible, <laughs> but like uh, that the closer you can come to establishing a daily practice of writing, and it doesn't even have to be playwriting, but just like just writing every day, uh, even if it's, you know, writing an email, but doing it every day, um, the better you just get at all kinds of writing. Um, and that's connected to like maybe tied for the best advice which is to lower your standards uh <laughs> the more you're invested in the in a daily creative practice and the less you're invested in whatever artifact you might create at the end of it the more likely you are to eventually catch on to something good great yeah speaking of lowering standards that's very much the case when i write <laughs> um so you gotta do it yeah, well, I try, but, you know, do, do you think create more creatives should try writing? And if so, what's the best way to go about it? Because I end up, I, I might getting a, get an idea and then when it comes to paper, it's just not happening. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I feel like if you, if you have an instinct that you, that you need to get better at expressing yourself on the page, then I think mm. it probably is a really good idea to to try it. But I think there are just different ways that people express themselves. And I think we're, um, particularly in the UK, but I think in the English language, like, um, there's just for whatever reason, more emphasis in our education system put on expressing yourself, uh, verbally than say visually or, uh, musically or like other, other types of expression. Um, yeah. And I think you can see that in a lot of our 
uh, playwriting and screenwriting and creative writing in general, that uh, there's a kind of emphasis on the primacy of the verbal. Um, and yeah, I think if you if you have the instinct that you have something to say and you want to write it, then you definitely should. But if you don't have that instinct, um, then you're right, you know, like cultivate maybe other ways in which you want to express yourself. Yeah, hire somebody on Fiverr to write the ideas for me. <laughs> yeah, why not? Playwright yeah, on Fiverr. You know. <laughs> well, um, there are so many ways to um, develop your playwriting skills, as you say. Maybe if you're just starting off, just get into a routine and write down whatever it might be. May there be song lyrics or poetry or thought bubbles or or anything together and another way of learning is um playwright groups and um you know i i, I worked on the high one that you kindly um spoke about earlier and there's obviously the, the you know the most well-known one probably at least that i'm aware of is the sort of royal, royal court young writers program um how useful do you think those playwright groups can be for um aspiring writers and do you think they're necessary for people to become playwrights these days it's so interesting that you use the phrase can be um, mm. because I definitely feel like I have come across people who have done those programs and in one way and another, like haven't really been able to catch hold of, haven't been able to motivate themselves to continue writing or maybe have like other things going on in their lives that meant that they have sort of put it down Um and other people that I know who actually have, like, I'm, I'm not going to say this person's name, but mm-hmm. I do know that one of the, one of, in my view, the most talented young writers coming through now. Um, I mean, she is still very young, but I don't know if we still say coming through because she's really very successful. Mm-hmm. Um, she was rejected by them, I think, three times. And I think in the end, she like won a fringe first. And 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 then like somebody at the royal court was like, "You have to accept her." Yeah. <laughs> like, guys, guys, <laughs> we've made a bit yeah. of a clock up here. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, so it's like, um, I definitely don't think. Uh, like, I think um, probably the people who who run these writers' courses would really want like nobody to slip through the net. Hmm. Um, but they don't necessarily have the energy or time or resources to make that the case. Um, And uh, certainly there are people who in one way and another are able to find creative space to continue making work, even though the gatekeepers uh, haven't like admitted them. Um, But I do think one thing that is great about um, writers groups is it offers you like a group of peers. And like, for me, I didn't go to drama school. Um, and, uh, I felt like for my friends who did, like I was, I I could see that they had like a crew. Um, and I didn't really have that until I started applying to writers groups. Um, Mm. uh, and, um, and that's like, yeah, it's a, it's a very important thing because it can be such a, especially writing, you're doing it on your own a lot of the time. Like it's really important to be friends with your peers. Uh, of course. Yeah. And I think that's right, one of the yeah. things that writing groups can give you. Yeah. yeah. Cause it can be so exposing, can't it? Writing. So it's nice to have people that you're working with that you trust that would give you valuable and honest feedback. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah Cause it's like, um, you know, with I feel very much this industry in, in all aspects is, um, who you know not always what you know kind of industry and i don't necessarily mean that in terms of opening doors but in terms of offering perspectives on things you hadn't thought about or just someone to talk to that gets you i think that 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 can push someone such a long way i know in terms of my writing i've been told by quite a few people that it is something that i should do more of that i have a talent for but as you say some people lack that motivation to put the words on the page because i find myself when i put when i do a performance on the stage or screen even if that might be available for people to watch at some point, I don't find it as exposing as putting yeah. my words on a page and then going back and reading them back. I I really struggle to get past that. And I think that, that that helped when I went on that writer's group that everyone was assessing everyone's work every week as as peers. I think that's that's hugely important. I do think that writing is uniquely exposing. And it's interesting because like um, I'm now... Uh, leading a writer's group 
uh, and two of the people in it are very brilliant and established um, actors who are beginning to write. And they're like, neither of them can really believe how painful it can be yeah. um, to just like, yeah, to put your, that somehow, somehow, even though it's literally their bodies, you know, being judged in auditions and, you know, like with thousands of people looking at them every night and, you know, like all of this, it's still, um, it's still strangely uh, exposing to, to, to just be you in the words. Yeah, that is strange. Do Do you think a literary agent is as as is it? Go on, can't speak today. Is it as important for a playwright as an acting agent is for a performer? No. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong. Uh, it is very important, and I um, I've heard people say that like you should never work with. I mean, uh, that like a theater will will not really let you be an unsigned writer. Uh, by the time your play comes to production because, like, writers' contracts are so complicated. Um, uh, And, like, yeah, it's just, like, better for everyone if you, uh, like, you just sort of can't, like, read them on your own no matter how good you are at that type of thing. Um, But um, uh, it's still, like, actors, it's very, very hard for them to get work when they're unrepresented. Uh, whereas writers, like there are lots of opportunities. There are lots of unsolicited script opportunities. There are lots of, you know, you can, you can in theory, like sit down and, you know, write a short play in 10 minutes. Do you know what I mean? Whereas yeah. like, doing acting on your own uh, is, uh, <laughs> I don't know, sort of a mixed endeavor. Uh, <laughs> Monologue to the dog. <laughs> So, um, like, it's always been described to me that, like, the function of a, of a playwright or a screenwriter's agent is to negotiate contracts, and that's a very important function. Um, but, like, it's not to get you work. Mm. Um, and that's, you know, that's a generalization. Like, I definitely feel like um, uh, agents can get you into meetings that you might not get otherwise. Um, but, yeah, like... Uh, agents rarely get you work. Um, mm. Whereas um, it feels like with uh, with actors, like, yeah, it's just very hard to get anywhere without an agent. So would you almost say that a literary agent for a writer is almost like a necessity due to their success rather than something that their success, like they need success to get, if that makes sense? Uh, yeah, that makes total sense. Uh, yeah. And that's, that is how I see it. Would do, would you think you you mentioned those unsolicited script programs and things like that? Um, and I know there's you know all the writing awards you've got the um you've got Papatango haven't you and you've got Bruntwood which um you got shortlisted for which was awesome. Um, do you recommend people do that first? Um, so instead of sending an unsolicited script to a literary agent, do you think most of them you have to sort of go out and earn your stripes as it were? Um, listen, I'm just going to be really honest. I think that like the writer's number one enemy is procrastination. Mm. Um, uh, I think you can get a no loads of times before you get a yes. Uh, I think that any action you can take to advance your creative life is a, is a good action. Um, and it doesn't need to happen in any particular order. So like, obviously if you're going to an agent and you're like, Oh, I was, you know, I've been long listed for the Brentwood the last two years and this is my new script and da da da. Like, uh, then that's obviously wonderful. Um, but like good agents know that talented people don't necessarily like make it through the gatekeepers doors. Um, uh, and, uh, good agents. Yeah. It's like, like they, they don't need that. Like what they need is, like an interesting point of view, uh, and somebody who follows through. So I just feel like if you, if you are like, if you have the impulse, if you somehow can get yourself together to submit a script to anyone, do it. Um, and recognize that it is, uh, I'm not going to say it's equally hard for everyone because it's, I don't think it is, but like everyone has that weird struggle. Um, so like mm. do it in whatever order, any order, just, just take action. 
yeah, yeah. just make that make it happen H- how often are writers part of the casting process because is it is it, is it is it is it like a case of just giving the script over to the director and they give it to the casting director and then that's the end of it for you or i think most unless it's a very short play um or it's uh or it's a drama school play uh, hmm. i think writers are always part of the casting process okay hmm. do you um do you find yourself surprised sometimes when actors come in that you'd almost because we all do it when someone walks into an audition room on both sides of the table where you, before anyone's even opened their mouths you make a snap judgment of them i think that I'm, I'm guilty of that i think um are you ever surprised when someone walks in the room that maybe your gut goes nah no this, I, I don't know what, what what we're doing here and then they they blow you away has that has that happened with with uh, your work i if i'm honest i always sort of assume that if that if they're in the room, there's probably a a reason. Hmm. Um, do you know what I mean? Like I don't, I can't recall having like written off somebody by sight. Um, hmm. uh, and yeah, and I do think you always want someone to do brilliantly. Like you always want to have a good time with people, even though you, even though like you can't cast everyone and. Uh, and maybe everyone isn't right, you know, like maybe your my writing is not right for everyone. And you know what I mean? Like, it's all good. Um, but yeah, um, the only times I can recall somebody coming in and me being like, oh my God, like this is a disaster, um, is, uh, twice people have come in very drunk to watch (laughs) (laughs) uh once a young man and once an older man um and it was like and you could smell the alcohol from the other side of the room it was just like oh my goodness like oh wow were they trying to go method for a character that was drunk or were they literally just turned up off off the nut i think they i think they turned up hungover i think i think they turned up no it was certainly there was no relevance to the and both times actually to their credit uh, towards the end of the audition, they did admit that that was what was going on. Um, <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. Well, we've, we've sort of covered there what you don't want to see from an actor in the, uh, in the audition process for your work. Can you give us some um, good things that you like seeing and you want to see in actors when they come and audition for your plays? Um, playfulness and curiosity. Um, I think that's, I think everybody wants to see that. Um, is like that there's this, so I was, I was speaking to an actor recently, um, who just had this like really wonderful way of talking about it. She's, she's an actor, a writer. And I was speaking to her because she was also a writer. Um, but she was like, yeah, when you're auditioning, like, it's just your opportunity to have a bit of fun. Like, you're not gonna, you know, you're not gonna book every job and that's okay. But like, it's, yeah, it's just your opportunity to have a bit of fun and to meet some nice people, hopefully. Um, And it's just like, yeah, great energy. Like exactly that. Um, I find, I don't know, like when I'm coming in for, you know, interviews, conversations, I don't know about whether or not I'm going to get a job. I find that if I'm like, oh my God, this is perfect for me. And I just like, I so badly want this. Um, Mm. I find it's like this weirdly counterproductive thing where I'm not necessarily able to have as like much fun. Um, uh, but like, yeah, if it's just like, oh, well, let's see what this is. Like, I'm, yeah, I'm interested and lucky uh, to be able to encounter this artist right now. Um, like, that's, that's always a wonderful way to, to walk into the room, isn't it? Yeah, I can completely relay when you when you go into the room, you're almost just relaxed. And if I get it, great. If I don't, mm-hmm. that's also fine. And that's when you quite often do your best work. Yeah. Eve, do you think actors should be working on their own scripts and and do you think that would help actors in their process if they're actually writing scripts themselves to break down scripts when they get acting work I mean again if you feel like if you feel like that's the way you want to express yourself then I definitely think you should it's not a coincidence that some of the best playwrights ever like a disproportional number of the best playwrights ever started as performers um yeah uh I mean, not sorry. That sounds like weirdly pressurized. <laughs> um, uh, you know what I mean? Like, actually, Off you go, Christian. I'm sure. Yeah. Like, there are so many. Yeah, like, like there are so many incredibly talented actors, multi-talented actors, um, 
uh, and uh, it's it's so exciting to think of what people might create um, if they have the if they feel motivated to do it. Um, but if you don't, I, I don't know. If you don't really feel like you want to write, like then definitely don't. Like I don't know, yeah. play the guitar, like whatever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It, it, it has so many parallels. I mean, being in the same industry as acting as well, isn't it? Where you get told on a sort of weekly basis that, you know, if you don't love it, don't do it. Do do anything else. <laughs> it will be easier. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's like, why why make yourself suffer? Mm. Oh, we're really selling the craft today. I love it. <laughs> it's it's um, yeah. fantastic. Um, I I read that you you worked as a director before you started on writing, and then I I saw this quote in an interview that you gave when talking about directing that you said that when you were directing, you always felt like you were translating. Could you explain that briefly, and then how does it feel now when if what I think you're going to say about translating is what it is, when you give over your work and a director translates that. Well, um, yeah, that is very, yeah, that I'm glad that somehow that got from my brain to a page because that is exactly how it used to feel, um, of just like, um, yeah, yeah. Translating like in the sense of like, I, um, I know what the impulse is, but now I have to put it into words for somebody else. Um, and, uh, yeah. And that's, and that's also, that's a, you know, that's not a bad feeling at all. Um, but it is really different to the feeling of writing, which is like the thing that I always go to. I'm not a good singer by any means. I'm in fact, I'm a terrible singer, but it mm-hmm. is the feeling of singing of just like that. There's something just like coming out of your body where you're just in harmony. That's, that's how writing feels to me. Like, and that, and that's kind of, like the flip side of if you don't enjoy it, like, don't worry about it. Um, Mm -hmm. is like that actually like writing is so joyful. Um, Mm -hmm. like obviously like any job, it's not joyful all the time. Um, but like it is so joyful. Um, uh, and yeah, and actually like, I love the feeling of, I tell you what, if you're handing over your writing to somebody who doesn't know what they're doing, that's very painful. But mm. most of the time, thankfully, uh, I'm tapping wood. I hope it didn't mess up the mic or anything. <laughs> uh, yeah, most of the time these days, uh, when I hand over my writing, it's like the most wonderful feeling because you're just watching people respond to, you know, like people respond to it and just being like, oh my God, I would never have thought of that. But you've like, you've understood this so beautifully and you've transformed it in a way that I could never have expected. Uh, and like, whether it's, whether you're talking to a director or designer or actors, you know, whoever, um, it's just glorious. Like, um, just seeing, yeah, like, I don't know, there are like a million different analogies about, you know, blueprints and then somebody else builds the house or blah, blah, blah. But it's like, it's almost like building a trellis and then there's like a living thing that, that grows all over it. Um, Mm. and you can't, separate the trellis from the living thing uh, yeah it must be amazing to be able to to give it over and have complete confidence in the people that you're working with how do you deal with criticism from journalist voices because i can imagine that's really difficult especially when you're you're first starting out in writing because it is so exposing yeah it is really difficult um or i find it really difficult um mm. I have to say, I am very careful about, uh, I try not to read reviews. Uh, sometimes I have reviews read to me, <laughs> um, uh, somewhat against my will. <laughs> but if someone, someone is like, Hey, I need to read you this. I'm like, Oh, do you? Okay. Cause it's like, by the time you walk away, like by the time you're like, no, I don't want to hear it. Then it's just like in your head. Um, yeah. anyway. Uh, yeah, uh, I think that it's really, I think that, um, I've heard a lot of different things from a lot of very wise people about, um, reading reviews and what you can learn from them. Um, but in my, yeah, experience, um, it's often the case that, uh, like, like critics aren't really writing for you. Um, 
aren't writing for the artist, like, and maybe they shouldn't be either, you know, like they're just, they're just writing for other people and it's, they're writing for the audience for, you know, whoever. Um, and their perception of your work is not necessarily going to, uh, inform your work. Like by the time they've perceived what they've perceived and then they've written what they've written and it's not targeted at you, but you're just like a normal human with kind of opinions and sensitivities like everyone. Uh, And so you're trying to read this thing, which is like what they saw, which is subjective. And then what they think the audience needs to know, which is subjective. And then you're trying to filter it through your subjectivity. It's not necessarily super useful. Um, Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's one of those things as well, isn't it? Where, say if you get dramaturgical notes as you're writing you can you know if you so choose to adapt your work or if as an actor you're auditioning or you're in the rehearsal room and you get a note you can change your work whereas critical reviews and journalistic reviews is of a finished product and I guess there's that frustration sometimes of well you know it doesn't matter you you don't write plays with the critics in the first place but it's almost that thing of well I can't change that now it's that sort of oh that's at least how I'd feel for someone that hasn't written something that's been published I I don't know how does that um sit with you at all yeah I mean I guess that makes sense but also I mean the thing is and again this is very easy for other people this is very easy to say when it's someone else's work getting reviewed and very very hard when it's your own but it's just like a lot of critics get it wrong a lot of critics are not that great at their job, even critics mm. who are great at their job. And there are some, uh, and we need, you know, I'm like very pro critic, like, uh, I'm very pro like broadsheet critic, uh, to get audiences in. I mean, not that not, they're not PRs, they're critics, but like, do you know what mm. I mean? Like I'm very, I, I want, uh, people who aren't super interested in theater to have contact with, uh, theater and ideas of what it is. Uh, I'm really in favor of the type of critics who are like academic critics. I'm really, you know, like I'm, I'm like all bloggers, like I, like the ecology needs criticism and Mm. needs reflection. Uh, and I'm extremely grateful for like everybody who chooses to do that. And also like, they get it wrong. <laughs> like yeah. they, they really, you know, um, over time, it's very easy to look back on stuff and be like, Oh, that was, that was something that nearly all of the critics missed, but the audiences didn't miss or the, do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, I would say that notes versus criticism are like almost two completely different I I in fact from in my point of view it's they're completely different things um because they're for their modes of communication for totally different purposes mm. um yeah uh and that's and again like that's they're supposed to be for different purposes they're they're for completely different audiences for completely different reasons yeah Eve, you mentioned about uh the audience what, what sort of effect are you looking for with your work when audiences come to watch your plays? Do you, is there a particular sort of... I mean, universal message? approbation and love, I think. Uh, <laughs> peace and love. <laughs> um, I don't know. I can't... I, you know, if somebody... If, like, the... I don't know. If a fairy came and was like, here, you can have, like, whatever effect on audiences. Like, you can... You, there's, like, one thing uh that Mm. you can make audiences feel for the rest of your life and everything else is up in the air but you can just have one thing i would say i would always want the audience to be gripped yeah um but i also think that maybe my perception of how to grip an audience uh that sounds really weird (laughs) but uh, (laughs) uh, chain them down yeah exactly um uh uh like uh, is not the same as everybody else's, you know what I mean? Like we all have different ideas of what it means to like hold the audience's attention. Uh, but I think that's the fundamental thing for me is to hold the audience's attention. That's what I would really like. Hmm. Well, it's that, it's that desire just, you know, 
whatever their their opinions they have on it at least have opinions no one wants people to be bored when watching their work i like in my opinion that would be as an actor as a writer as anything i'd i'd settle for anything other than someone being bored or disinterested um yeah i i sort of feel like I, i've somehow turned this round to being like quite a negative thing uh where it's like it is definitely true that like in my head rule zero is don't embarrass the audience and rule one is don't bore them. Um, but like, yeah, but actually like what I want is to like, yeah, for the audience to be like, um, delighted and haunted. I'd really yeah. love to make work that really persists in people's minds, uh, that they keep coming back to. Yeah. Maybe I want that even more. I don't know. Yeah, I like that. It's it's something I, I I you know you'll discover as 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 we all carry on with our work, isn't it? Is how we want to be seen by people, or and it sounds a bit egotistical, but it's not from that place in my eyes, is it? It's from a you know you just want to you want to have an effect with your with your work, otherwise why would you be saying things? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I'd love to briefly talk about um, Midnight Movie, which was on at the Royal Court because of the way that you um, had that play um, produced, as it were. Because it had it had BSL, it had captioning, audio description, and there was the digital body, which was um, emailed out content inspired by the play for those who would be physically unable to get there. Where did that push from inclusivity come from in your head for that play? And then as a sort of tack on to that, how does theatre and the creative arts in general be more inclusive to audience members and actors with um, disabilities, whether they're visible, hidden, whatever it might be? Um. Well, uh, from when I first like wrote the beginning, I wrote like a 12 page kind of weird fever dream version of Midnight mm -hmm. Movie, uh, when I was, uh, on a residency with the Royal Court. Um, and, uh, it was, um, I knew that I knew that I wanted to work with an all disabled team, um, because I hadn't always identified as disabled but actually like, uh, I'm legally blind and I have been since I was born. Uh, and, uh, I also have, um, a different, a, a progressive condition, um, that is causing me a lot of pain and kind of in, yeah, ha over the last five years has, um, gotten kind of noisier, that condition. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and, um, well, I mean, it's longer than that, but over the last five years, especially has been, um, has been particularly disabling. Uh, and, um, yeah, uh, I just knew that I wanted to find a creative space with other disabled people, um, and see what we made when we were all together. And the first thing we made was Midnight Movie. Now we've um, we've now made a, a subsequent, um, another digital body called Invisible Summer, which, uh, is also, it's just now begun. It's like second, um, airing from the Royal Court. Uh, I'm not sure if they're going to release it. Yeah. They've, they've just begun to release it twice. So I don't know. We'll see if it has a future beyond that. Fingers um, crossed. That sounds fantastic. Uh, it is going to be released as part of the um, the Stukmacht of the of the Berlin Theaterplatten this year. So there will be another opportunity to see it through that. Brilliant. Um, uh, but yeah, and I know we all like everyone on the Midnight Movie team like wants to work together again <laughs> soon. Um, uh, yeah, um, I think. Uh, I think it's one of these things, you know, the, the analogy that I keep thinking about with, uh, with inclusivity is like, it's easier to not have creative captions, for instance, in the same way that it's easier to just not pay people. Uh, yeah. and, um, and the reason why we pay people is that if we don't pay people, then the, we're not pulling from like a proper pool of talent. We're, we're pulling from people who can afford to work for free. Um, hmm. And similarly, like if you don't make your work accessible to deaf people, you're just pulling from a smaller talent pool. Um, and you're just like, you're just shutting people out of that experience. Taxpayers who are, you know, who are paying your salary. Um, if you work in subsidized theater, um, 
uh, and the same is true, of course, of, of many, and like, obviously, like, um, there are all sorts of ways that the human body functions. Uh, and sometimes people's access needs can even be in opposition to each other. Like there have been circumstances where um, I need lower lights because I'm, I have a migraine. Uh, and I've been in rehearsal rooms with deaf people who really need bright lights because they're already kind of, yeah, like the intensity of their concentration is something they just need to be able to see like as clearly as possible. Um, uh, and yeah, and it can feel like, it can feel like those needs are directly in opposition to each other. You know, it's a, um, it's not as simple as just saying all of our work needs to be universally accessible because universally accessible doesn't exist. And yet all of our work needs to be universally accessible. There's just no justification otherwise. Um, uh, it's just shutting people out in a, in a, obscene and deeply unfair way Mm. Um, uh, so that's where I'm coming from with that I guess yeah well thank you for um for sharing that I think it's something that's that's really important I think you know writing um so from my personal point of view um I don't have a disability myself but I have a close family member that is um severely disabled so um, any pushes that I see in the creative arts because I think you know anyone can appreciate music anyone can appreciate a performance anyone can, p- can appreciate art so um if there are more writers and creatives out there like yourself doing that kind of work then I'm all here for it I also think um something that gets lost too much in in these conversations is that um uh any kind of uh kind of access intervention is a formal intervention. Uh, and it's a way of, it's an opportunity to be creative and it's a way of making your work more interesting. Um, uh, and, uh, yeah, I, and I, I sort of feel like people, uh, talk about it, um, as if it's, um, just sort of a virtuous thing, uh, rather than, uh, a genuinely exciting creative thing and um actually like it is it is a genuinely exciting creative offer uh it's an opportunity to think more deeply about the about the practical ways we tell stories about the ways that people pick up stories especially people with sensory disabilities um and to have more fun with that and like why wouldn't we want to do that you know yeah totally. yeah everybody's got a voice and everybody deserves to be heard e, this is going to be a probably a very difficult question but what's one play every creative should read wow yeah that is a difficult question yeah um uh i feel like what you should do like is just like hang out in the in the shared kitchen of a in a shared kitchen for like a day and Mm. just write down everything that happens and that's like the one play that everybody should read is like um just go to a shared space and look at the way that shared space is negotiated uh whether it's intergenerationally or uh from people who are just flat sharing or uh whatever um but yeah um just write down including punctuation everything that is said for a day uh and that's like, I don't know. I think, I think that's the one play that everybody should read. I don't think you get anything more legit than that, would you? Um, um, I'd love to quickly um, ask you about what you're working on right now. Cause we know you've got um, quite a few um, exciting commissions on the go and projects on the go. And I don't want to ask a question that you can't answer in that regard. So what are you working on at the moment? And what, if anything, can you talk to us about those projects? Um, I'm really excited actually about the things that I'm working on at the moment. Um, so what you're officially supposed to say in like bios is like who's commissioned you, but not what it's about. So I think yeah. I'm going to do the opposite of that. <laughs> right. Um, let's do it. I'm working on a play about um, a girl who develops kind of a relationship with a voyeur um, across her road. And Lovely. I'm working on an adaptation of Pinocchio. And I'm working on uh, a play about what happens when you get sick in public 
um, and how that intervenes with, um, yeah, intersects with other kind of notions of identity and kind of expectations that people have of you. Um, what else? Uh, I'm uh, writing a play about Greenham Common. Mm. And uh, and a, uh, a horror story set in the American West. <laughs> I just... You see, that, that was an even better answer than I could have possibly hoped for because I think it sums up your creative um your your way of working is that i don't think a single play of yours is 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 similar at least from my untrained outside eye like the the diversity on show there's incredible i love it um can you quickly it's just brilliant can you quickly talk to us about what a day for you as a writer looks like in terms of um your process how you write um, especially when you've got so many projects on the go, how, how, how do you go about scheduling your days or do you just sit down and see what happens? And I presume, as you, as you mentioned earlier, with agents required for contracts, because they're that complicated, I presume it's, it's similar when you've got multiple commissions with multiple deadlines that you do have to be structured to a sense. But um, how do you go about your work? Well, it's funny you should ask because we are recording this in like the second week of a very bleak new year. Um, mm. And uh, I was just saying to a colleague earlier that like, I've discovered that I can't write grant applications or like just applications for things uh, anymore on the same day as I'm writing creative stuff. Like, I just feel like my stamina is really low um, Mm. right now. Um, But yeah, in general, um, something that uh, somebody smart and more experienced than me told me is that if you're, if you're having a full-time writing day, um, you can only like, don't expect to do, to write and research for more than five hours. Um, uh, I find that like a really good writing day, I'll be able to write for three hour and a half sessions. So like mm-hmm. an hour and a half and then like fucking about or researching or kind of a combination of both. Um, and then like eating something and then writing another hour and a half and then fucking about and da da da. Um, and yeah, uh, like, so like an hour and a half in the morning, an hour and a half in the afternoon, an hour and a half in the, in the evening. Um, is it, that like non stop yeah. those hour and a half? Do you mean by like when you get down and do that hour and a half writing, it's a sort of smoke coming off the page or laptop kind of thing? That is what I mean. Um, but mm. also, if you could do 45 minutes in each of those time slots, that would be really good. Uh, and if you can only do two times, you know what I'm saying? Like, like, I really do think that writers are, um, often very mean to themselves and, um, and weirdly that doesn't help you write more. The thing that helps you, I think this is kind of what I was also trying to say about lower your standards is like the thing that gets you better is writing more and, you know, kind of administering like horrible mental shocks to yourself, um, is Mm. just not going to help you write more or better. Um, uh, and so, yeah, it was really like, I, the reason this person told me this, um, is that I, I wrote to them being like, how do you write for eight hours a day? Like, how would that, Oh my God. Um, and they wrote back, like, I never do that. Are you crazy? (laughs) Like no (laughs) one ever does that. Um, yeah. Um, so, um, and I feel like it's really good to have um, sensory cues at the beginning of a writing session. So I'll, um, I like to like light a candle or like, I feel like the smell of matches is like a good sensory cue or like uh, incense that you like or light a candle or, you know what I mean? That it's like, if you're like, okay, and this is what I do right before I do the thing that, you know what I mean? Then it's like, it gets you unconsciously kind of ready for it or like drinking a particular kind of, tea or coffee or something you know it's like your your pre-game routine as it were totally what do you do when you you have them sessions scheduled and then you're getting the famous writer's block and, and nothing's coming and ideas aren't flowing do you just walk away and go for a walk or that would be smart mostly i <laughs> just scowl at my friend. like i'm not i don't know i need to get better at being more uh more lucid about moments like that um but I do think, though, that sometimes, like, um, sometimes just writing a load of shit 
is um, what you need. Do you know what I mean? Sometimes the way you yeah. overcome the block is just by writing a load of shit and then continuing with the draft. And then when you go back over the draft, you're like, well, that was a load of shit and delete it and do better. You know, like actually mm-hmm. I do think that sometimes it's uh, good to push through in those situations, mm-hmm. but also maybe that's just like, because I'm a stubborn idiot and th- you know what I mean? Like, I don't really know if that is a, maybe I would save a lot of energy if I were to just go for a walk in those moments. Mm-hmm. I like that, though, because it's almost physicalizing the writer's block. It's not going nothing's coming out because it's 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 never really nothing. It's just the wrong thing. I like, terrible, I like the way that you... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it, it's almost like I want to see all these playwrights that I read. I want to see their writer's blocks on the page now and just see what was what was thrown away. Um, I'd love to just quickly um, ask this before we finish. Um, how do you think? theatre should adapt to the world as we see it now we we won't bring up specific keywords that I know we're all thinking about but how do you think theatre should adapt can adapt will adapt this year and beyond man that is such a good question uh and uh I feel like the only answers I can think of are like ridiculously utopian but fuck it why shouldn't they be ridiculous let's go yeah um, I think there should be a living wage for um, everybody who, uh, well, I, sorry, mate. I think there should be a living wage for everybody. <laughs> like yeah. that's what I think, uh, I think, um, yeah, uh, uh, that um, uh, releasing the economic, like the, the number one, like emergency thing for me about um, theater right at this moment is trying to find as many ways as possible to release like the economic agony um, that most theater workers are in right now. Um, Mm. And a lot of our most important theater workers. Um, uh, Yeah. uh, I would like if there were more grants for people to just rest. In fact, I would like if there was some kind of sabbatical system so that after seven years in the biz, you get to spend a year doing some other thing. Um, and, uh, and then come back, uh, if you want or, or whatever. Um, uh, yeah. Um, but I think that the thing, um, I think that almost all, uh, forms of injustice, uh, and structural disadvantage, uh, come down to a material cost. Um, and so, looking even though there are other issues at work um in in all forms of disadvantage like looking at material disadvantage first um is yeah a quicker way to re- to relieve agony <clears throat> and also to um uh to diversify uh the industry brilliant i i think that's i think that's a lovely note to end on i think always looking looking forward positively is this is what we should be doing isn't it to, to, to go on that walk um so uh, thank you eve so much for agreeing to come on and talk to us today and uh, giving us your time and sharing your knowledge it's it's we're hugely grateful and it's been a really lovely chat and a really nice way to spend my evening so thank you so much for coming on oh thank you so much for having me um it's really been a pleasure and such like interesting questions like i'm really glad that people are asking questions like this Brilliant. We'll we'll gladly um, annoy you again in the future and have you come on and ask um, and ask some more of those questions. So thank you so much. Thank you, Eve. Look after yourself. Thank you for taking the time to listen to our podcast. We hope you enjoyed it and learned something. We look forward to having you back in the room very, very soon.